Well, all righty then. Let me get started this morning. Just have a couple things to say. First of all, thanks, uh, thanks to, to everyone who put uh, the uh, uh, Operation Christmas Child shoe boxes together this year. We had a pretty large group of boxes come in from a relative that was here, but all together we ended up with 68 boxes this year to go to Operation Christmas Child. God bless you. Good job. And uh, a lot of the boxes we had, uh, because, you know, it costs money to fill the box, and then they want all your money to ship it. Man, shipping is crazy nowadays, isn't it? So we had someone, that's an, uh, an anonymous donor, say, I'll pay for those that want to uh, fill a box, but maybe want to put more in the box than for the postage, and they paid for the postage for a ton of them, maybe in somebody. So thank you for that. Uh, also, a big thank you to the ladies that were here yesterday to put Thanksgiving boxes together for those that were needing Thanksgiving boxes. I think they put a dozen or so together. And I think, do we still have two left? We still have two left. If anyone knows someone that needs a, a Thanksgiving box, the meal's already there and it's next door in the freezer. All you got to do is take the box. It's a whole meal. Take it and uh, give it to someone that's going to cook it. I, I have funny thoughts sometimes. I hate to say them because I know it'll offend someone. And I, I still look, if, you, if I haven't offended you yet, hold on. <laughs> it's your turn. Your turn's next. I maybe just haven't gotten to you. Just give me a minute. <laughs> but I think about the, uh, like the Thanksgiving meal uh, in our society as a whole. You know, I, one of the things that's changing about our society is things like Thanksgiving. Do you know that the Bible says that in the last days, one of the signs the last days are here is people being unthankful? <laughs> just plain unthankful. And I think about cooking. You know, that whenever this whole pandemic started, one of the things people were pushing for is to keep supporting your restaurants. Keep supporting your restaurants. And I kept thinking, man, does nobody cook at home anymore? Is the restaurants the most important thing for us to keep going? Now, I'm not trying to take away anybody's livelihood. Don't get me wrong. But I'm like, I remember when I was growing up, I, I don't remember. I honestly could not tell you how old I was the first time I went to a restaurant. My grandmother raised me. She cooked all the time. We ate at home. We ate around the table. We ate there. And now, whenever Thanksgiving comes around and we have all these Thanksgiving meals that we're handing out, you know, a lot of people don't even cook Thanksgiving anymore. I'm like, how sad is that? Michelle cooks enough for all of us. <laughs> I mean, all of us. Like, this. <laughs> and the neighbor two of us in the house now, she got off. Oh, Thanksgiving is her favorite holiday. She loves Thanksgiving. Just to cook a big meal and us eat the big meal for Thanksgiving. And the reason she loves Thanksgiving is because it just seems like Christmas. There's more expected out of you. People expect things of you for Christmas. It's always just different. We love Christmas, but eh, we like Thanksgiving. So be thankful this year. I'll talk more about Thanksgiving as we move on. But just another reminder, no Wednesday night service. No Wednesday night service. Amen. Because the holiday season is upon us. Amen. So we want to give everybody time Wednesday night to start cooking. <laughs> now, that I, now, that you, now that you know you can cook at home. All right, so this morning we're going to start Guard Your Heart Part 2. This will be Guard Your Heart Part 2 this morning. Last week we, we started to Guard Your Heart. And we read Ephesians 6, chapter 10 through 18 is our foundational passage that we're using. Uh, because this is, we're talking about the armor of God. This is a series where we're referring to the armor of God. And it says in verse 10, Finally, my brother, be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore, <coughs> having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. So that's our foundational scripture we've been using. But let me recap just a little bit. You know, if you read that, you'll find out there's two reasons that we're told to put on the armor of God. The whole armor, not just part of the armor, but the whole armor. There's many people that only put on one piece of the armor, and it's the helmet of salvation. They get born again and figure, well, I said the sinner's prayer. We've got this thing called the sinner's prayer in the Bible. And 
Uh, we get people to repeat that. And we say, well, you, you pray this prayer and you're born again. They forget that the part of that prayer is believing it in your heart. <laughs> Actually believing what you're saying. Believing what you're praying. And many people will put on the salvation part of it and forget there's other armor. And one of them, the very first part of that armor that talks about is the loin belt of truth. A, a belt that, that holds everything together. The loin belt of truth. The truth of God's word is what holds everything together in our lives. One of the reasons we struggle with serving God is because we don't know uh, the truth of the Word of God. It, the, people can talk us out of the Word of God if you can't stand on it. You know, Adam and Eve, Eve, Eve was in the garden. And here come the serpents asking Eve questions. Eve couldn't honestly answer the question. Uh, he, Adam, uh, the devil said, has God said? And she said, we can't even eat it. We can't even touch it. God didn't say you couldn't touch that tree. But adding to what God said, God said what you couldn't do. Apparently there was a disconnect somewhere. So the devil says, yeah, but has God said this? Oh, God knows this. God knows that. And she could, not, she could not fight with the truth that she had. The problem with a lot of us is we don't have enough truth to fight the enemy when he comes. We don't have enough truth. We don't have enough foundational truth inside of us. We think because we got born again and we got salvation, we went to church when we were a kid. And we went to church a few times and we heard the pastor preach and, oh, I'm, I'm born again. And then, and then when Satan comes, the wiles of the devil, the tricks of the enemy, they come in. And we don't have enough truth to stand and fight. You know, there's that, 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 that part of a, a, a psychology that we learn all the time called flight or fight. You know, whenever the, the pressure's on and something happens, you have two responses. You either fight or you run. A lot of people I, I, I will run. A lot of people will try to fight, but they're unequipped. Ill-equipped, however you want to say it. They're not prepared for the battle. Amen, somebody. Amen. But it gives us two reasons for putting on the armor of God. The one reason is so that we can stand against the wiles of the devil, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. You don't wrestle against other people. We don't, we don't wrestle against one another. And we have to put on the whole armor of God and protect ourselves in the spirit realm against the enemy's attacks in the spirit realm. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. Say, say we wrestle, we wrestle. Not, not against flesh and blood. And the second reason, it says, so that we can withstand in the evil day, which I think would be a, a place in time, an evil day, a place in time. It could be even talking about the last days. Do you know that as the last days, we continue to move into the last days, you see Christianity changing right before our eyes? Why is Christianity changing? Why is the church allowing so much in the church anymore? I can tell you why. Because they're wearing a helmet and nothing else. They're wearing a helmet of salvation saying, well, I'm born again. I'm on my way to heaven. I said this sinner's prayer. Thank God that I'm a Christian. And don't get discipled. They think being a Christian is the answer to all. And that's not what your Bible says. It's not what your Bible says. I've said this many times in here. Jesus never called his followers Christians. Jesus never called his followers Christians. He called them disciples. And the funny thing about that, you know, this is the part Pastor David was, was saying, and this is why I, I am like I am sometimes. Some kind of like, Pastor Gene, he still says some stuff that could offend somebody. Well, Jesus did too. And Jesus would offend people, and, the, and his disciples would even say, Jesus, don't you realize you offended them? He's like, yeah. Sure did. I, I, know, I want to do it again, too. Hold on. But this is the part about discipleship. Did you notice Jesus never chased any of them down? He said, come, follow me. And it's a, well, no, wait. That ain't what I meant to say. Come back. Come back. This is what a lot of folks get frustrated with me as a pastor about sometimes. I know they do. And that's fine. But you know that... I know pastors have a, a lot on their plates and a lot to do, and one of the things that people want to add on their plates is every time they have a problem, pastor, come run, help me. Listen to my heart here now. I know people that had computer problems at home, and the pastor had to come fix it. People <laughs> had car problems at home, and the pastor needs to come fix it. Every little problem pop, pops up at home, and the pastor needs to drop off what he's doing and go help. Every time somebody steps away from the church for a couple weeks and don't, and they're mad at somebody, pastor got to go straighten it up. Did you also notice? I'm getting on discipleship here. Not even, I'm, Lord, help me with my notes, but I ain't on them right now. Did you notice that the prodigal son left home and the father never went after him? Pastor's supposed to do everything. Pastor's supposed to run after people. The disciple is the one that says, I will go where I need to go to get taught what I need to be taught. 
I will not expect the pastor to come to my house and disciple me. I will come to be discipled. Jesus did not tell those disciples, hey, you got to stay home. I'll make my rounds. That, that father of that prodigal son did not say, hey, son, please don't go. Please don't go. And then he started chasing him down the road to wherever he went. He said that father stayed right there where he was supposed to be until that son decided it was time to make up his mind to return. And that son came back and the father said, welcome home, son. And people think the pastor is supposed to run around and chase them because they're offended. Oh, Lord, I think, now I'm getting into my message. <laughs> yes, I... Lord, gee, that's where, that's where my, my, my thinking and my mindset is different than that. I love you and I appreciate you, but i got work to do here. I'm not going to chase everybody around trying to figure out why they hadn't come back to church. Amen. Come on, somebody. I know some, oh, well, I never heard a pastor say that. I love you. I appreciate you. I want you here. I want everybody here. But I ain't got time to chase everybody down. Because I got mad at something I said last week, but they don't like my tone. They don't like his attitude. That, who is that guy? Same guy I be every Sunday. <laughs> so, <laughs> and that's the reason that you have to put on the armor of God. Every time something said that rubs you the wrong way, suck it up, buttercup. Put on the armor and fight. <laughs> so we have two reasons to put on the armor of God. The enemy, the wiles that he tries to trick us with. He has tactics. That's one reason we put on the armor. The other reason we put on the armor is because there's an evil day coming. And this evil day, people are going to start falling away. And the pastors are going to try to do every trick in the book to keep them in the church and not care where their soul or their spirit is as long as their butt's in the seat. Come on, somebody. So what's wrong with a lot of these churches? I just want you in the seat. I'll tell you whatever I need to tell you to get you here as long as you show up and, and keep the chair warm. So make it look like we've got a, a church. There's no church without the, tr the foundation of truth in it. The truth of the gospel, the truth of God's word, the Holy Spirit leading and guiding. Just like Pastor David said a minute ago, I'm sitting there doing praise and worship and the Holy Spirit's talking to me so many times and that's why I get up here and say some of the things I say is because I'm like, okay, Holy Spirit, what do you want to say right now? I, I know for a fact there's a lot of people sitting in this room every Sunday morning and their mind is so distracted when they leave they can't even remember what I said. How many times have you left here and then somebody asks you what the preacher preached and you say, I don't know, but it was good. <laughs> How many times have you left the church service and, and then when it ten, an hour later you couldn't even remember what was said? You know why? This was on something else. This was thinking about problems at home. This was thinking about relationships. This was thinking about lunch. This was thinking about work and money and, and everything else. This was Martha mentality. And Jesus said, wait a minute, there's a needful thing this morning. There's a needful thing this morning. Get your mind on me, says the Lord. Stop what you're doing. Think about me. Amen, somebody. Amen. Put on this armor. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. Put on that belt of truth that holds all of this together so that we can stand and fight whenever the enemy attacks and we can stand and fight when the evil day comes. Which, in my opinion, is already here. Come on, somebody. So we said the first weapon we put on is a belt of truth. God's word is our truth. The belt of truth. God's word. It's what holds everything together. You can't fight without truth. Right. You can't fight without truth. It's a losing battle to try to fight without truth. And the next part that we've been discussing, the next piece, was the breastplate of righteousness. And the breastplate of righteousness <laughs> is, it, it covers many vital organs in our body. But we discussed last week, which one of the most vital organs do you think the breastplate would be protecting? The heart. The heart. The top of the list of the, what the breastplate would be protecting for that soldier would be the heart. The breastplate of righteousness that we put on, that we receive from Jesus Christ, what part of our body do you think we're protecting? Our heart. The core of who we are. The foundation of who we are. Who we are as a person. Who we are as a disciple of Jesus Christ. Amen, somebody. Amen. This is what Solomon, anybody know Solomon in the Bible? Anybody know the books he's written? The wisest man who ever lived is what people call Solomon. Now, if the wisest, ever, if the wisest man ever lived had something to say, shouldn't we listen? Yes. Yeah, I, I believe so. I mean, I know that some of your opinion, some of you value your opinion pretty highly, but you're not the wisest person in the world. Sorry. <laughs> Proverbs four twenty three. Proverbs four twenty three. Getting windy out there. I mean, it's been windy out there. It's windy all morning. I think I'll go flying. 
least one direction anyway. <laughs> Woo! Go that way. Proverbs 4.23, keep the heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. In another translation, it says, guard your heart more than anything else, because the source of your life flows from it. We have to guard our hearts against the attack of the enemy. The wisest man that ever lived says, guard your heart. Guard your heart. Doesn't, doesn't Jesus say, take heed what you hear? Take heed what you hear. Take heed what you listen to. Take heed what goes in your, your ears, your eyes. Take heed what comes into this life. Why? Because what comes in here is going to be what flows out of here. Garbage in, garbage out. Amen? It's what comes in and, and infiltrates the heart, the core of who you are is what's going to come out of your life. Out of the abundance of the heart, say it again. out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Mm, that's deep. There you go. Mm. <laughs> See, the enemy would like nothing more than to hurt us at the heart or the core of who we are. And of course, the heart we're referring to, this is where we talk about the heart. A lot of folks get pretty, pretty literal here. Did you guys know you have a heart in here? It's a, it's a blood pump, right? And it's just a, an organ. Now, when you tell somebody you love them with all your heart, you say, Looky, this blood pump right here, I love you with all of this. This heart. Is it, is it, is it, because some people, when they talk about heart, you have to understand what's in, in, what it entails to talk about your heart. Your heart is the core of who you are. It's your feelings. It's your emotions. It's your thoughts. It's your mindsets. It's your traditions. It's your foundational teaching. It's, it's who you are from a child on up is what creates the heart of who you are. You know, I, don't, I tell people all the time, don't blame your circumstances on what happened to you as a child. We know that we shouldn't do that, right? But then you have to look on the other hand, too, that I'm just a bigger person than who I was at 10 years old. I'm the person that experienced that at 10 years old or 12 years old or 15. I, I am still that same person. So it's kind of hard to say just forget it and let it go. We just have to learn how to deal with it. But what happens at us even as children causes us to have a certain foundation or, 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 or thought processes, uh, uh, whatever that we have emotionally or in our feelings, we act a certain way because of the way we've been brought up. And there's many times as even as children, people didn't help us guard our hearts. And we were wounded or we were offended and we started putting up walls and we started figuring out how to protect ourselves. Amen, somebody. Amen. Mm -hmm. so this goes deeper than you think it would whenever the Bible says guard your heart. For out of it flows the issues of life. Guard your heart because your heart is where everything's coming from. But the way you act, the way you live, the way you talk, the way you behave. Hmm, that's good stuff right there. See, we can't, we can't feel, think, or reason with this blood pump, but we can think, feel, or reason with our inner heart, the inward man of the heart. See, many people have been wounded in their feelings, thoughts, and emotions because there was not a breastplate of righteousness in place to protect them. This is what I'm talking about when it comes to putting on this breastplate of righteousness to fight the evil ones. We've been taught just get born again, and, and, and once we get born again, we're just supposed to suffer the attacks, forgive everybody, and not be taught how to prevent the, the, the hurts and the wounds and the attacks of other people. Especially us men. You know, us men are tough anyway. Say what you want. It won't offend us. Yeah. So grandma man, don't cry. Yeah. <laughs> Elsie? <laughs> Elsie, if you're a woman, you wouldn't understand. like this, but what does it mean? Don't take it to heart. You know, every time somebody says something does not mean they're trying to hurt you, they're not trying to wound you, they're not trying to offend you. Some people just say things sometimes off the cuff and it's like, wow, well, what do they mean by that? You better put that breastplate up. <laughs> Did you hear your breastplate? They might not have meant to offend me. I'm going to guard it, guard it. Guard the heart. They said it. Oh, I'm about to cry. <laughs> but I'm not going to man. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Look, I, hey, hey, hey. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Everybody cries. If they don't, something wrong with them. Yeah. 
See, the truth is, though, we do get wounded and we do get hurt because we haven't learned how to stop it at times. We, we don't understand that breastplate of righteousness is to protect our heart. You know, protect our hearts. We are the righteousness of Christ in, uh, righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. We have, and righteousness have been imputed into us. And whenever shame and guilt comes, we just take it on like, okay, yeah, you're right. I'm no good. I'm unworthy. We let shame and guilt play its part in our lives because we haven't put up the breastplate of righteousness that says, no, I'm righteous. Devil, you cannot lie to me and tell me I'm not. People can't lie to me and tell me I'm not righteous. Every time, you know, there's this thing even happens with a lot of people that when bad things happen, they think, oh, God must be mad at me. That's not true. That's not true. First, first of all, let's get this straight. God's not mad at you anyway. And you can't do it. You can't do anything to make him mad. He's in love with you. For God to love the world that he gave you Jesus Christ. He's not mad at you. Now, he might not be smiling all the time, but he ain't mad. And, it, and we have to protect ourselves from being wounded and offended. Because you know that wounded and offended people are the hardest people to press through their true relationships sometimes. Yeah. Because the wounded and offended person will put up that wall and says, that'll never happen again. You're not going to do that again. Nobody's going to do that. Again. No, uh -huh. Say, no, uh -huh. no, uh -huh. <laughs> You know, wounded and offended people are the hardest people to get back to church. Wounded and offended people are the hardest people to preach the gospel to because they're wounded, they're offended, they're not going to open their hearts. Wounded and offended people are the hardest ones to have real relationships with people because they won't just open their heart, let that wound go, let that offense go, and learn how to protect it from happening again, prevent it from happening through the protection of the breastplate of, of righteousness. Amen, somebody. Amen. Of course people are going to say things to offend you. Of course people are going to say things that hurt you. You're not immune. You're not going to make it through this life without people saying hurtful, harmful things to you. Never, never, ever will you do that. It's not, it's, not, it's not possible to make it through this life without people hurting you. The issue is, what do you do about it when you get hurt? And how do you prevent, prevent it from happening the next time? So where it doesn't offend or wound to the point that it did the first time. You put on the breastplate of righteousness. Know who you are. That's how a lot of people get wounded and offended. They really don't know who they are. And then other people tell them who they think they are, and they take it to heart. Well, I must be no good. I must be unworthy. I must be worthless. I must be what they said I am. No. What does God say? <coughs> Put on that breastplate of righteousness. See, many people get wounded and offended, and then they blame it on God. You know, there's a lot of folks that won't come to church because they, they're church hurt, is what they call it. I'm like, look. If you're going to stop going places because you were wounded or offended, you're going to be indoors all your life. You're going to stay home all your days. There's no reason to make it up an excuse just because you don't want to go to church because somebody offended you at church. Somebody made you mad at church. Whoop, did he do? <laughs> Once again, people. You know, that's the number one thing that's wrong with churches. There's people in it. <laughs> this pastoring thing would be easy if there was no people. <laughs> right? I heard a guy say the other day, I try, I try to really be nice to people when they say silly things. I was with a guy the other day, and he said, yeah, my father, I think he said his father-in-law or his uncle. Yeah, I think it's his father-in-law. My father-in-law is a pastor. He seems like, man, he's always happy. He's always got it together. I thought about becoming, becoming a pastor because it looks pretty easy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I said, but let me let's start here first. I said, before you do that, how about get up every Sunday for the next year and prepare a Sunday school lesson for your kids? Do that for a whole year without missing a Sunday. Just, just get a Sunday school lesson prepared for your kids and get up and give it every Sunday morning. Just for a year first. Then, think about it. He said, no, I was just kidding. I wasn't really thinking about doing that. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm like, I said, yeah, yeah hallelujah. I said, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a position you're supposed to be called to. If you're called to it, I'm not going to say it's easy, but it's easier than if you just think it's a job. I'm called to do what I do. And I put on my breastplate of righteousness because you're not going to knock me out of my job, my role, my, my calling. Amen, somebody. I'm going to put it on. And when you come, when you come at me with that offense, I'm going to say, cha -ching! <laughs> I got my breastplate ready, baby. Come on. Say what you got to say. I'm going to walk away and say, Woo, thank you, Lord. <laughs> that was educational. <laughs> Same thing you guys ought to do. Whenever you get in situations and conversations aren't going the way you think they ought to go, don't, don't get offended. Don't get hurt. Don't get wounded. 
Just say, okay, I'm going to put on my breastplate of righteousness. I'm, I know who I am in Christ. I love you. I appreciate you. And I'm, I'm trying not to offend you. And I'm not going to let you offend me. Amen, somebody. Amen. So, but the problem with wounded people, you know, wounded people usually wound people. Hurt people, hurt people. Offended people, offend people. It's usually a, a retaliation and a lashing out. I don't know if any of you have ever been in a relationship very long with another person and get in an argument with them. Sometimes you wonder, where did that come from? You dug back deep to get that one to throw at me, didn't you? <laughs> you dug way down deep to find something to hurt me with with that one, didn't you? The conversation gets all crazy when people are arguing and fighting with one another. They bring all kind of nonsense up to offend and wound and hurt the other one. Why? Because they felt offended, wounded, and hurt. It's just, just what we are. It's what we do as humans. Hurt people, hurt people. Wounded people, wound people. But who's at fault? I think about that sometimes. Who's at fault? The wounded or the wounded? The devil. Who's really at fault? The devil. Personally, I think it's both. I think both are at fault. I think a person trying to wound somebody just out of being hurtful, I think that's wrong. But I believe a person getting wounded or offended is wrong. Why? Because you're supposed to have on the breastplate of righteousness to protect your heart. Does it mean it's not going to hurt? Does it mean what they said well, uh, uh, is not something that should hurt you or offend you? No, not saying that. But put on that breastplate and guard your heart. Especially, especially in church. You know, this is what I think about church sometimes, and I know folks don't. Some folks think church isn't that important anymore. I heard somebody say this the other day. You know, we're trying to uh, rediscover church and revitalize church and get back in church. And I said, see, I told you you shouldn't have told everybody to go home. The church wasn't important. We got a pandemic. Everybody stay home. Because why? Because the church ain't the building. It's the people. I'm like, you better balance that with something. Because now they're all going to stay home in their jammies and think they ain't got to go to church. Why? Because you just told them it wasn't important. And now everybody's trying to get people to come back to their churches. And I'm thinking, praise God. I hope, I hope it works out for them. We never stop. I'm like, we just kept doing what we were doing. Why? Because we know the importance of it. We know the importance of going to church. And people will get offended and, and, and they won't come to church because somebody wounded them or they, they said something to them that kept them from coming to church. So who's at fault for it happening? Just because it hurt doesn't mean that you've got to live through that hurt. You put on that breastplate of righteousness and said, nope, i still got to go back and be a part of the body. And this is what I think about when I think about how important the church is. The church of Jesus Christ. Not say the open arms church, but church attendance being a part of the universal church of Jesus Christ. Anybody ever heard of Noah and the ark? Right? Noah and Ark, right? Anybody ever heard of that Noah and Ark? Well, there was a flood coming. Destruction. It was coming. And God said, hey, Noah, build an ark to save you and your family. Hey, family. <laughs> build. Amen. That's right. Hey, family. Hey, we're, we're building an ark here. Yeah, Why? Because destruction's coming. Yeah, right? And, and we got to get out of here. And you see what happened? The flood came and lifted up the church out of here. That's kind of like the rapture. That, that ark that come up off the earth, that's like the church is going to be one day. We're going to come up off this earth and go to heaven. Amen. The ark was a representation coming up off that earth and being lifted up out of the trouble. Amen. Come on, somebody. Amen. But can you imagine uh, that out there on that ark, uh, Moses put all... Uh, Moses. The other Noah. <laughs> Noah Moses. <laughs> that's a trick question. That's good. How many animals did Moses put on the ark? <laughs> None. Right? So, so Noah's got all these animals on there, and he's got his family in there, right? Now, to the animals, it probably didn't matter much. But can you imagine, after so many days, how that ark started to smell? Oh, yeah. <laughs> can you imagine a, a week in, two weeks in, six months in? Like, mm, this is one stinking mess. <laughs> That's the way church feels to some people sometimes. That church is just one stinking mess. Well, how about, how about look at the church as an ark? I bet not one time did one of Noah's kids say, this place stinks, I'm getting out. <laughs> I think I'm jumping ship. Really? Where are you going? So this is what I think about church, and this is why I'm not, I've never left church. In the, the years since we started going back to church, I, I got this revelation and understanding. It might be a stinking mess in here, but it's the only safe place. Yeah. <laughs> you might feel like sometimes things are a stinking mess in your life, and you might come to church and see the cause of it. I don't know. And you might be in here like, I'm getting out. I can't do this anymore. I think the church is the safe place. I wouldn't leave the church, not that I was a part of, if I were you. And any of your friends, you know, if they're part of a church, tell them, don't leave. Stay there. Stay in the safe place. You know, you always talk about these safe spaces. I'll tell you where the safe space is at. It's in church. Well, not all churches, but a lot of churches. 
There's some churches that I wouldn't go. No, I, if you want me to make you a list, I will, but I'm not there. I'm just glad I'm not like them. <laughs> okay, never mind. So I would say when it comes to being, a, uh, being the offender or the offended, you've got to be careful because uh, I think you're both wrong. If you're offending people, stop. Unless you're me. If you're a pastor, it's okay. If you're offending people, stop. But if you're being offended by people, stop. Stop. Don't, don't let people offend you. I didn't say it's not that it's not, I can't reiterate that enough. It's not that it's not going to hurt. It's not that people are going to, to hurt your feelings or hurt your emotions and, and get at you and try to get under your skin at who you are, but stop letting it offend you because your offense is causing other people to draw away because you're lashing out from your offense. Why? Because hurt people hurt people. Wounded people wound people. The enemy's number one job really is to drive a wedge between us. That's his biggest job. Just drive a wedge between people. Drive a wedge between the church. Drive a wedge between the, the believers, the body of Christ. Let them offend one another. Let them, let them be angry at one another. Let them not have relationships with one another. Our job is to not let that happen. Right. Our job is to put on the breastplate of righteousness and guard our hearts. You know, some, some people don't even know how much they are being used by the devil, so you've got to look at them and say, I love you guys. I used to have this conversation with one of my relatives many times, and they'd call it, just want to argue all the time. And in the middle of the argument, I'd just stop and say, I love you. What? I said, I love you. What's that got to do with it? I said, I just love you. <laughs> I, just got, I just love you. And there was one argue, so I'm like, yeah, I love you, though. I'm like, I don't know what else to say. I do. But you're just trying to offend me. You're trying to wound me. But I love you. And that was the... That was one of the premises that Jesus was trying to teach is like a lamb led to the slaughter. He was like a lamb led to the slaughter. But none of us want to put on that quality and be like a lamb being led to the slaughter. We want to be like the donkey bucking everybody off. <laughs> you ain't hurt me by acknowledging. I know what you said last time, and that'll be the last time that you said what you said last time. None of us want to uh, uh, put on that humility that says, hey, slaughter me if you must, but I love you. And I, might, I might put on a front sometimes, and I might be hard at times, and I might be this, I might be that, but I'm going to try to walk in love, and I'm going to try to walk in humility. I'm not going to let you wound me and hurt me to where I cannot let the life of Christ flow out of me. Amen. Wounded, hurt people stop letting the light shine. Amen. Amen. And I told you guys uh, that I've had, I, I shared some things with you last week that I don't think I'd ever shared before. I've had my share of ridicule and folks coming against me for being a Christian. I've had people, I mean, I, I don't know about you, but how many of you actually have had people write bad things about you on bathroom walls? <laughs> Dave says he has. Anybody else? I mean, if I ever walk in this bathroom and there's something written bad about me in there, <laughs> I'm, I'm really, <laughs> I might be offended that day. <laughs> That, that might do it. That might, that might be over the top that day. I don't know. But I even had a guy one time, and he, it's funny because some, some people, I had a guy I used to do it because I'd try to share the gospel with anybody that I thought was open to share the gospel. And he'd ask me all the time, ask me all these questions about the Bible. And I'd give him what the Bible would say. And he said, well, you can't judge me, though. I said, I didn't judge you. You asked me what the Bible said. I just told you what it said. And this happened probably, I don't know, years that me and this guy worked together talking about that kind of stuff. He actually went and got a tattoo on his back one day that said, only God can judge me. Because he thought I was judging him, so he even wanted to tattoo it on his body to let me know that only God can judge him. I'm like, well, you're right, and that's not anything to brag about. <laughs> you, you think that's something special. I'm like, I would be scared of that fact. We should all be scared of that fact. That God will judge us. He can and he will. And he got a tattoo because he thought I was judging him. Now he, he liked tattoos, so he just thought that would add to it. I'm like, dude, come on. I've had people make some really nasty remarks and say a lot of things over the years about me being a Christian and me taking a stand for what I believe. And I shared that with you guys. And it was... I told you guys that last week, and funny story, funny story, funny story. I, you, you, can't, you can't write scripts sometimes better than God or the devil can show them to you. While I'm up here preaching Sunday morning, 
And, I'm, and I don't know if I was at this part or before the part, however it's at. But I did talk about this last Sunday. An usher was outside here Sunday morning. And somebody walked through the parking lot of this church, a young man and a young woman. And that young woman is pointing her finger at this church screaming, I hate pastors. I'm thinking, what real-time evidence do you need that there's people out there that hate us as Christians? Now, I'm hurt, and I don't know, the person must not know me. Or they say, well, at least I love one of them. 